the next speaker is uh, Mingyu Yu. He is a principal scientist at NVIDIA, and he is the inventor behind many of the state-of-the-art gun-based image generation techniques. In fact, the best way to introduce him is probably to point out that references to his work were spread across all of the slides that you saw so far. Um, and without further ado, you can take your watch. Just for your introduction. Uh, just, for, uh, just for coming to uh, the presentation, uh, today I will be talking about FUMIT, or you can call it FAMIT. Uh, so it stands for Few Shots Unsupervised Image to Image Translation. Uh, this is the joint work with uh, Shin, Arun, uh, Tero, Ms. Ryder, Timo, Yako, and Yang. So I'll start uh, with a small introduction to image to image translation. So uh, this task considers uh, learning a function have to map an input image in one domain to a corresponding image in another domain. Uh, so in this case, it's a sunny day to rainy day. And this work, uh, this uh, problem has received uh, increasing attention over the last few years, and I think probably one of the recent uh, data here. And uh, there are many different uh, uh, methods, and these are some of the results uh, we have achieved so far. On the top left is the state algorithm. Uh, Taysom Park and I talk about uh, that method in the afternoon. And uh, in the bottom left for the dog to cat is our last year's uh, work. Uh, called MUNIT, uh, stand for multimodal, uh, translating a dog to a distribution of cats. And uh, on the right hand side, uh, earlier results uh, uh, from MUNIT, uh, from uh, winter to summer, uh, day to night, uh, sunny to rainy. So you have to see that the field has advanced uh, uh, quite a bit uh, over the past few years. So uh, this problem, uh, this problem can be studied in many settings. Um, the most common two settings is supervised and unsupervised. Uh, in supervised setting, the training data consists of samples with paired supervision, like uh, an input segmentation mask and the corresponding output image. You have a bunch of these pairs and use these pairs to learn the function f. The main function. Uh, in the unsupervised setting, you don't have corresponding images. All you have are two data sets, one from a domain, and uh, the, uh, you want to learn f to learn the mapping between you know, the f function mapping one to the other without any supervision. And of course, the, this setting sometimes uh, called paired and unpaired or aligned or unaligned. Um, so in this presentation, I will just use supervised and unsupervised. And as I mentioned earlier, there are many works in space. Uh, in a supervised setting, mostly you have two domains, D1 and D2. D1 is the source domain, D2 is the target domain. And you will care about learning uh, this function app. <coughs> Uh, unsupervised uh, setting is a more challenging, uh, more challenging setting. Uh, so to regularize the training, uh, people sometimes learn uh, two-way translation function. So you have uh, F1 to 2 from D1 to D2 and uh, F2 to 1 mapping back. You learn these two mapping functions jointly, trying to uh, make the problem more well constrained. And uh, Today's uh, uh, the finish will be more like uh, uh, this uh, this flavor, <coughs> and of course uh, you can generalize uh, image translation to multi domains. Uh, this is several words. There are several words in the space: uh, Stargen, Kambogen, domain plane. Uh, Stargen is probably one of the more popular one. Uh, so in Stargen, uh, they consider multi domains uh, simultaneously. And uh, uh, they have a kind of a sh uh, kind of shared representation between all the domains, 
and uh, to translate image from D1 to D3, you first come to this representation and then map from there. So the way it was implemented is you have the encoder, encoder input image, and you also have a one half vector. You know, determine what is the output domain gonna be, and uh, you have a decoder to generate the outputs. So here you have the input uh, faces, uh, starting to results on uh, human faces, you have input, and uh, uh, now you have a domain called angry, and uh, then you can, by setting up the vector correctly, you can output the angry face, or happy face, or fearful face. So, how about unseen domains? So there are many other uh, expressions a human face can have. How about face after eating a lemon? <laughs> and the, and this is a couple of images I downloaded from Google. Uh, so this, this is not included in the training data set. But ideally, we would like to generate uh, human faces, translate human faces to have this expression. This is more like a new domain, right? And because of uh, when you train a multi-domain uh, image translation network, if you don't consider this uh, in the design, so you cannot do it. So this is clearly a problem. And why do I want to combine future and unseen domain? You know, so what do I mean by future is uh, most likely you will only give uh, will only be given few example image of that new expression you want to generate. So. So it's, it makes sense to consider these two settings together. And you want to have an image, image translation model that can translate images to an unseen domain by leveraging few images of the unseen domain even in the test time. So you are not going to retrain your model. In the test time, you are given a few example images, and you want to translate those, you know, those images you know to this new domain. So, to achieve this, uh, this goal, you need to extract domain characteristics from few example images, given in the test time. And uh, because there will be many unseen domains, you, you probably want to have one model that can handle all the unseen domains. This is clearly an interesting combination, uh, quite challenging, but useful. You know, one network for all the domains. And uh, more importantly, human can do it. And I feel like uh, this is the case toward making uh, machines uh, more creative. So, so far, image translation, uh, image translation method chip is more or less pattern recognition. It hasn't go beyond that region. So I'm betting that uh, if we can train machine to operate in future setting, maybe we have a chance to go beyond pattern recognition. So I mean, this is a motivation example. You know, for a person seeing a standing tiger for the first time, and they can imagine how it looks like when lying down. Not because you see a tiger lying down before, because you see many other kitties lying down. So you can use this analogy to think about how a tiger will look like, or another new animal you see for the first time, how will it look like in a different pose. And uh, clearly, we know that uh, when you have tons of images, you can do a very good pose to deep bar translation task. And uh, why then you have only one image? Okay, now we'll start to talk about the films. So uh, you know this is what our model achieved. So given inputs, uh, I think golden retriever, and give a new new breed of dog, an image of new breed of dog that the model hasn't seen during training. Uh, but the model is able to extract uh, characteristics from the example image and the translate the input uh, golden retriever to other. The Tunisian uh, new breed. And uh, this is an example of translating all kinds of food to uh, chow mein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like this example, you know, particularly when I'm hungry. Uh, 
So, uh, okay, now talk about the setting. So, um, so in order to train a, mo a model uh, that can achieve this task, we have to <coughs> define a training objective to give such incentive. So what we do is uh, we have a, a large set of training data of different object classes. You know, here we have uh, S classes. It's a big number. You can think about 100 or 500. During training, you ask the model to practice, to operate in the future. Time. So you are given a content image uh, of this particular breed of dog. And you give some kind of uh, example images of the other breed. And then you ask this network to learn how to translate this dog breed to another by just using these few example images. You keep uh, asking the network to do uh, search practice you know, by randomly sample different uh, source and uh, target images. Keep doing so. And in the test time, uh, when given unseen uh, target class images, because the model has been prepared to, to, to extract uh, important characteristics from these few sample images still training, it has can extract important characteristics from these few sample images and to translate a dog to this new uh, breed, which is a mountain lion. So it's more like a human, right? When you see, if you only see one kind of animal, say a dog, you probably cannot do well for other animals. But when you go to a zoo, when you see many different animals, then you get more experience, and then you can do better uh, in the future setting. So uh, this is the network uh, we use to achieve this task. So it has a content encoder, uh, which is um, um, consists of a bunch of convolution filters and some residual block. And there's uh, another uh, module called class encoder. Uh, and so it, it's more like a VGG-like network. And uh, it's operate on a set, a set of image instead of one image. And then you have a decoder, uh, and we'll go to the details very quickly. Uh, so the content encoder, what it does is uh, given a content image, you extract a representation, uh, which is a spatial map. A spatial map is a good choir, kind of give incentive for this network to keep some kind of important post information, like the location of the years or the location of the months. And uh, for the class encoder, uh, for each input image, you extract a vector, dimensionless vector. It's just a, a more like a signature of this uh, uh, class image, which is the target we you want to translate the input image to. And you may have a few uh, example image from these target classes. For each of them, you extract a, a characteristic vector, uh, which is more like a cell vector and you compute the average, you have an average style for this uh, target uh, class. And this style vector uh, will be passed through a, uh, a small fully connected network uh, to compute uh, the AI parameters, which is uh, the mean and the standard deviation that will be used to control the behavior in the decoder. And the decoder uh, is uh, basically uh, take the content code and uh, there's a couple of AI residual block. And AI residual block is a residual block where the normalization layer is replaced with AI, which means that uh, the activation is first uh, zero mean and unique variant. And then you will uh, use the learned mean and variance to kind of transform the activation and uh, uh, then you have a several convolution layer to gradually decode the images. So by using this uh, model, we actually adopt the inductive bias <coughs> that uh, the cast information can be pretty much uh, encoded using the mean and the deviation vector. The first and second order um, statistics of the activation control the class. And the remaining is 
including the special layout uh, is provided from the content code. So we train this network to translate this uh, into uh, source cards to the target cards by the, using these few example images. And our discriminator uh, doing a, uh, it's, it's more like a, a, a multiple adversarial uh, discriminator. When you say that, uh, okay, this, this breed uh, is breed A, and there's a specific, uh, the, the discriminator, uh, the output units of this code correspond to this grid had to be uh, had to say that uh, yes, this, uh, had to say no, this is not a grid, and the generator tried to uh, fool the discriminator. Uh, to regularize the training, we also uh, use uh, reconstruction logs. So, meaning that uh, if your content image and the target class image uh, are the same image, then the output should be itself. Kind of reconstruct itself. And by performing this training in the test time, you are given uh, a new breed, mountain lion, uh, each, each had the, the, the class vector, the style vector, and then we can translate this uh, input uh, dot to uh, mountain lion. So these are the uh, some results from the, uh, the animal translation task. So we use the uh, ImageNet um, uh, Carnivorous Animal Classes for, for, for this task. That data set consists of 149 different animals. We use uh, 119 animals for training. Uh, in the test time, we evaluate the results on the remaining 30 classes. So those 30 classes were never seen uh, during training. And to understand the image, uh, the result here, uh, X is the input. Uh, Y1 and Y2 are the target class image given in the test time for the translation. So you, you see here, uh, we, uh, the model translated the leopard to this uh, sharpy dog to have uh, this uh, of image. And here is a lion to shop it off. And it, it, I think this is a German Shepherd to a mere cat. So the translation results uh, should be interpreted that the location of the ears and mouth should remain roughly the same. Uh, but the, the, the shape and the texture should change accordingly, should change based on the input uh, target class images. And this is another uh, more challenging task, uh, which is translating uh, one bird species to another bird species. Again, X is the input. And you are given uh, this um, another a new breed of bird that the model never seen during training. And the model is about to translate the input to this particular species. Here. So, so again, uh, the model can achieve this because we ask the model to practice translating between these four forty four uh, training classes during training. Uh, this is another result on uh, uh, flower datasets. Again, X is the input, and Y1, Y2 is the unseen target class image provided in the test time. And you see that our model can translate flower to the corresponding uh, to, to the corresponding flower in uh, in the new uh, domain. And here is a good example. Uh, so. I think it's Chopin, uh, and the input is a uh, hard dog, and then uh, the, our model can translate hard dog to Chopin. Uh, to understand the translation, you should, you should help see that uh, the shape of the output image is pretty similar to the input image, but the texture is replaced by Chopin. And uh, um, so uh, translating rice to curry rice is relatively simple, uh, and uh, 
Um, so here you see that uh, the cake is uh, is on the plate, and uh, then uh, we then just uh, just uh, the thing is uh, poke uh, and and to have the shape like this uh, cake and the plate and then. And this model also was uh, for human. Here we use uh, uh, each identity is a class. And uh, say you have this gentleman here, and you provide a few images of this lady, and then we can translate this uh, gentleman to this lady. Uh, the pose is roughly the same, and uh, uh, you know, but the appearance is like the lady. And here, it's another example, uh, I should say this uh, gentleman to the lady. Uh, the head here is replaced by hair. And of course, we know who this person is. Um, we just said to a female. So uh, there, are, there are two, there are two, uh, two, two behaviors I'd like to share uh, with you uh, that we found during uh, working on this algorithm. First thing we found is uh, the performance uh, is posi positively, uh, positively correlated with number of uh, domains seen in training. Means if you have more experience, if you have access to more variety of uh, uh, classes during training, you can do better. So what we do is, uh, I mean, this is the result on the animal data sets where we have uh, initially we have uh, 119 animals in the training, and but now we kind of vary the number of uh, classes available in training from 69, 79, 89 to 119, and then measure the performance. Uh, again, evaluating um, evaluating image translation model has been quite difficult. Uh, so we use a couple of different metrics for the evaluation. Uh, so for, for the, in the first graph, we use a classification accuracy. So because we it's an image net, so we have classified trend you know, to identify the, the, the class. Then we, we, we use uh, this classified to, to classify the translated output to see if it match the target class. And the accuracy become an indicator of how good the translation model is. And uh, so we found that uh, when you see more training classes during training, uh, the performance is improved. Uh, this second metric is uh, content dissertation. So when doing image translation, you want the, uh, the pose to remain roughly the same as the translation. Uh, so we use these uh, metrics based on perceptual loss uh, to quantify if these uh, uh, translation outputs have similar pose to the inputs. And also inception score and the FID. So they are all kind of positively correlated, uh, you know, performance correlated with the number of training data. And also it's correlated with the number of uh, essential images given in the test site. Um, there are some limitations. Uh, for an animal translation model, if you provide a flower image in the test time, it will not be able to translate the animal to a flower. And similarly, if you provide flower images, and uh, um, if it's flower image and the cast is an animal, it will not do the job. And there are also failure cases. Um, you know, the, there are three kinds of failure cases. The first kind is uh, the input and target class. Uh, the, the, the model kind of mix these two animal species together to create a new species. And sometimes uh, the model will just ignore the input image and just uh, you know, copy the, the class image. And sometimes it's ignore the class images, the target domain images, and just copy the input image. So these are the typical failure modes. So uh, we made a demo uh, uh, in the web. It's still running. You can try it. Uh, we translate, uh, uh, um, you know, you upload a uh, head, and then you click on the head, and then you click on translate. It will give you uh, corresponding animals. So we put this uh, app on the web, and people start to try it. And some people use a very uh, kind of rare 
uh, animal to test the results, and uh, then they start to use their own places. <laughs> other people's places. So this is a new kind of uh, image that I think I've never seen before. Um, okay, uh, let's conclude my talk. So um, the topic of today is uh, trying to extend the image to image translation research to the unseen domain in the future study. And I believe the important uh, gates toward a uh, more creative uh, machine. And the call and data will be available in this website. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. So people have different definition of view shots. Um, so I know because we don't include the um, the, uh, the the target of the image in training, so some people call it zero shots. Right? So, but I, I'm kind of thinking that uh, because in when you try to produce the generation output at the moment, you have access to the target of the images. So I try to make a more restrictive setting that it is actually few shots. My question is that uh, you mentioned failure casing, and is there is that possible to have a simple add-on to adjust uh, the importance of the content versus the, the style of the species in the testing time without change, without retraining the model? It's a good question. I haven't thought about it, uh, but I but since you asked, I think it's possible to play with a little bit of interpolation in the cast code to achieve this task. Mm -hmm. But I never tested it, so I think it's an open research problem. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.